I'm Trevor Carolyn. The region known as Cascadia ranges from southern Alaska down the long British Columbia coast through Washington, Oregon, and into Northern California. Writers, artists, musicians have long been drawn by its rugged wilderness beauty. People here still live so close to nature that it's ingrained in the way of life. No wonder Greenpeace was born right here in Vancouver. Ecologically, even Cascadia has problems, and more may be coming. So, uh, for old Bernie's great poem, Pacific Door, about a plea for tolerance, um, an early multicultural poem in Canada, one of the first, I think, uh, was written just up here. So there's a great deal of history about this part of uh, the Lower Mainland here on Burrard Inlet. And the irony, of course, is that right across from us is the the oil refinery, the terminal, which has been the basis of so much controversial media coverage in the last time. This green sliver uh, of North America that has long prided itself on environmental consciousness is just about, in the next year or two, will decide whether or not it will become a carbon export hub of global significance, or whether it will say no and stop these projects, uh, thereby uh, keeping in the ground some of the largest and nastiest fossil fuel deposits anywhere on the planet. You're going to put a pipeline across a huge bit of of a very, very wild uh, landscape where many different cultures live, the complexity of that decision uh, it sh it should make us stop and think of, of, of costs and benefits. You can't do a cost-benefit analysis that's going to tell you what to do. You have to do something much, much more sophisticated and listen to the stories and pay attention to what this means at a much profounder and much more elusive level. It's difficult not to feel voiceless sometimes, but there are many kinds of activism. One of the most powerful is activism of the ethical imagination. Uh, I really believe that after 40, 50 years in the environmental movement that um, we need a new language, and I think art and metaphor is the language of the change that it's going to take. I think when you start a piece of writing, you look at yourself. You give respect to the place where you are, to where your where your landscape is, what time it is, it, and then you begin this act of writing. It's like all of a sudden you, you have empty space, and then you address yourself to that empty space, and you identify where you are in this intersection of time, location, and your act of writing. Cascadia's community mosaic brings together settler North American, indigenous First Nations, and trans-Pacific ideas from Asia. These elements offer an increasingly interconnected way of balancing the modern demands of the sacred and the urbane the wild and the civilized as we prepare ourselves for the inevitable shifts ahead due to climate change. The Cascadia Corridor that links the region's three major cities, Vancouver, BC, Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon, has much to offer that's progressive. Vancouver's civic mandate is to be the greenest city in the world. Seattle's powerhouse high-tech corporations such as Microsoft, Boeing, and Amazon give it the USA's greenest business economy. Portland is renowned for its public participation in civic issues, for its awakened approach to urban planning and transportation. The next step is a deeper awakening, individually and collectively. Cascadia's geographic boundaries are also a thought or consciousness boundary. Who better to articulate this state of mind than the poets, conservationists, and visionaries that you'll meet in this program? They'll be sharing their solutions to some of the most urgent challenges of our generation. Concern for the future of how we want to live and develop in this bioregion inspires thinking here regarding sustainable ecological alternatives. 
A key issue in Cascadia is that when environmental concerns don't match up well with economic and business issues, things tend to break down. We were really catalyzed by the way that conversations about oil pipeline development, and particularly the Kinder Morgan pipeline, were happening in BC because we saw this incredibly polarized debate with economics benefits over here, environmental risk over there, and nothing happening in the middle, no conversations about the economic risks of the project. And, and also we saw a real lack of solid fact-based information. So, you know, we saw a lot of propaganda pushing for projects, and then we saw a lot of activist language really strongly opposing them, and neither one of those felt quite right. We were really missing that in the middle. If Vancouver becomes an oil port that is fundamentally reshaping our economy for the next 40 years or more, and so, of course, there's opportunity cost for that. The risks are going to be felt by BC residents, BC businesses, people living near tanker traffic and pipeline routes, um, First Nations communities that it's running through. We see huge amounts of profit actually flowing out of the country and then huge amounts of risk being taken on here. Oil company executives are having to talk about social license for the first time. One of the things that ecologically minded thinkers from Cascadia are saying is that we need a better means of communicating between different factions in a less polarized way, that writers traditionally function as go-betweens, as scribes, cultural transmitters. Writers and creative artists help to set the agenda for culture. Mythology teaches us that knowing how to ask ourselves the right questions can be almost as important as having the answers to our problems. We have to decipher the deeper meanings of our questions. As far as I'm concerned, poetry is everywhere. It's in, it's in, uh, it's in everything, unless somebody's gone to a lot of trouble to, to eradicate it. Language is what something becomes when you think in it. So we can talk about the language of music, the language of, of paint, the language of Haida carving, the language of Ojibwe uh, uh, birch bark uh, drawing, all sorts of, of things. That's okay, but, but these are metaphors now, right? And, and language itself is a metaphor. Uh, meaning is in things. Uh, language is a way of, of, of paying attention to, to, to that meaning and, and, and planting things in, in that soil and growing this meaning into a big, uh, lovely things. I mean, you think of language as the leaves on the tree or the, or the twigs or f flowers or something. It's, but languages are life forms. They're, they're, they're actual beings, they're alive. You, can, you can't weigh them and measure them, but they live, they're immortal. Uh, they're born and they live lives and they die. And while, while they're alive, they do an awful lot of useful work for human beings. The mythology is, is an ecosystem of myths. It's a, it, it, it's a forest of myths. It's a watershed of myths. It's a, it, it, and so, you know, there, you can go around in it forever and never learn everything about it, uh, but you can't systematize it in, in, in the way, you know, industrialized Europeans want to systematize everything and we say, well, it starts here and you follow this path and you get to it, the end of it here. There is no such, there, there isn't a beginning in that sense and there isn't a, 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 an end. And so you can, you can start anywhere. People who want some kind of contact with the, who have come to the West Coast or maybe to visit and decided they would like to stay here because it's a fine place to be, those people are more apt to listen to ideas about the ideas that know something about how to how to be where you are, how to find out where you are, and and and, and, and incorporate yourself into that place instead of trying to turn it into something else. So the, in, in so far as the Asian ideas, Buddhist ideas, uh, Taoist ideas uh, belong to that old tradition of listening to the, to the world, listening to the land, listening to the Tao, uh, they make more sense to, 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 to the kind of people who might be living here. Zen ideas coming in, some of those ideas going into the New York Expressionistic Art School. Have you had a sense of, of any kind of uh, lasting importance of that importation of ideas or that layering of ideas into North American art and letters? Oh, I think it's hugely important, just hugely important. It's, it's the, 
You know, it's like putting the, the two halves of the broken world back together again. Writers and artists inspired by environmental groundings distinguish between traditional nature writing and bioregional or ecological points of focus. The difference is a matter of social and political engagement that Pope Francis notes in his statement on the care of our common home is also a spiritual engagement. Artists in Canada have always drawn inspiration from the land. She had a significant influence on me, uh, and I think she's had a significant influence on a lot of Canadian artists, even to this day. Uh, she does tend to get blended with the Group of Seven. I mean, how is she different? Well, she's different in one respect. She's very West Coast. Group of Seven and Emily Carr uh, realized that they had a treasure in this land, like Canada. Canada is a great country. And it's a land of great wilderness, of untouched wilderness. And instead of looking back at Europe, and uh, you, you know, all the cultural aspects, all the cultural baggage of Europe, they looked to the land. She almost spiritualizes the forest too. I think that's the thing for me, uh, and I'm sure for many other artists, she, she gives a spiritual component to those forests. I think that's what everybody recognized. Uh, everybody recognizes about her work, and that's why her work is so great. Cascadia means land of falling waters, and I thought it was appropriate for those of us who live in this part of the world. I grew up with the sound of water, rivers, creeks. Water is in these poems, the pieces I read. I think water actually forms part of my imagination. This first poem is for my youngest daughter. Siwash Rock, for Salia. Sing to me, she said. Sing me the name of the man turned to stone. Again and again, remind me of the hero and what it is I need to know about currents and tides in this burial place. What of the mask and the moon's blue face? Where do you go when you go far away? Here, where the river meets up with the sea, oh, sing to me, Papa, the story of water. Am I not your beautiful daughter? Sing me to sleep, sing me awake. Teach me to see the shape of the old in the haze of the city and all of your ghosts. Is it true that we're made of rubies and clay? Stay with me, Papa. Sing me, oh sing me, the very first names. Mythologies are stories, good stories, from our artists, scientists, from our wise elders. They explain things. Anthropologist and National Geographic Society explorer Wade Davis suggests that we need a new story to explain the world we live in and to inform our decision making. Where a people choose to live and how they infuse that landscape um, with, with metaphor um, is as vital to their both survival and their, their identity as any other aspect of their cultural adaptation. The way we think about landscape and our place in it is, is very um, readily, uh, um, um, the origins of it are very readily seen in our own intellectual tradition. We, we live in a rainforest, as you can see. We're surrounded by, by mountains, big trees, the water, and the power of that is ingrained in our in our in our being. Um, uh, sometimes we forget that, especially uh, the the people that are living in the more urban environments. But when push comes to shove, uh, and we're threatened, the environment is threatened. We intuitively know that um, we have to respond to try to save something we could potentially lose. Well, I was fortunate to have actually met Dan George 
1971 when I was a student of philosophy at the University of, of Alberta. And he came to speak to our class and he spoke, he spoke about the relationship of, to Mother Earth and the relationship that he had uh, with the land, with, with the animals, with, with, with the sea. And he, he, he brought forward this, this notion that nature has a soul that we've got to recognize. Even uh, Gary Snyder once said, uh, uh, you find your place on the planet, dig in, and take responsibility. Gary Snyder, who's a hero of so many of us, was, I once asked him what the most important thing one could do as a young person for the environment, and he responded, stay put. The human imagination has flourished in virtually every habitable region of the world. We tried desperately in Europe to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith that had shackled us during the, um, you know, for much of our history. And in, in doing so, we liberated the individual from the collective, which was a sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. But we also, with a single phrase from Descartes, saying that all that life was just material and matter, or, you know, um, we deanimated the world and, and we swept away all notions of myth, metaphor, mysticism, which had really been cloaks of comfort that had helped us organize our, our, our sense of belonging in a universe that, um, uh, you know, was so infinite. In a more concrete example, I mean, I, I was raised to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined. I mean, that was how I was raised. That makes me very different than my friends in the highlands of Peru, raised to believe that every mountain is a deity, an apu, that will direct their destiny. Now, the interesting thing is not who's right and who's wrong, but how the belief system mediates the interaction between the human society and the natural world with profoundly different consequences for the ecological foot. What do we mean when we say make something sacred? I think part of it is, is understanding at a deep level that there's a certain kind of um, mystique of the earth that's based not on a self-conscious notion of being close to it or that the earth is sacred, but on a far more subtle intuition. And that's very much the idea that the world itself and the land itself is literally breathed into being by human consciousness. You know, politicians follow, they rarely lead, and polemics are never persuasive, but storytellers change the world. And to me, that's why I tell stories. The Cascade Range intersecting the Canada-U.S. border is where Gary Snyder and novelist Jack Kerouac worked in the 1950s. Their friend, poet Allen Ginsberg, visited the region often, too, and he shared their interest in spiritual ideas from Asia. Colin Sanders has been a keen student of such East Asian influences on Cascadia Pacific writers. Um, one, of, one of Alan's poems that um, really, really uh, turned me on, as it were, in the 80s was uh, I first saw it in The New Yorker, and it was called Whale's Visitation. You know, that, that, uh, in that poem, he actually uses the word uh, ecology, and he's talking about being on this uh, mountain in Wales and uh, quote-unquote uh, particulars that he is um, observing and noticing and being mindful and aware of. Uh, for instance, um, the smell of the, the fecund earth and the smell of the grass, the moist grass. I think that six gallery uh, reading was uh, a turning point. Gary uh, read uh, his poem, uh, Berry Feast, you know, uh, talking about uh, tr the trickster coyote and, and talking about, um, again, a local environment. So that poem was read, um, which of course was very different from the poem that made the headlines, which was Allen Ginsberg reading uh, uh, his version of Howell uh, for the first time publicly. A lot of people associate the Sixth Gallery with the first reading of Howell, but we also associate it with Michael McClure's poem that you mentioned about the death of uh, 100 whales, um, you know, murdered by um, U.S. Um, you know, Navy seamen. Well, I think there's a myriad of connections and interconnections. It's these mountains that connect. It's these mountain ranges that connect. Many young people are turning to new green forms of everyday sacraments as expressions of the basic human need for inner serenity. They're changing consumer culture by creating a new kind of community. They've begun renewing reverence for the simple joys of voluntary simplicity and frugality, a locally based diet of bike riding, recycling, 
yoga and insight practices, teaching children, organic gardening, using public transport, and greening their neighborhood. It's a return to the spiritual appreciation of the interconnections between the natural and human worlds. Pagan, it's an attitude toward the world that depends, uh, as we were saying before, on this balance between interconnectedness and, and disconnectedness, and be, learning how to be alone with with the world, how to be dwarfed by the world, how to be overwhelmed by the, by the, by the, by the world, and, and, and take profound pleasure in the fact that you are so small compared to the world, and you know, and yet there you still are. But the, you know, the sacred is, the sacred is there, and it, uh, it's inescapable. No difference exists between body and mind, language and mind, language and body. What is, is not. You must love and let loose of the world. I used to write poems, and like yours, they were made out of words, which is why they said nothing. My friend, there is only one word that I know now, and I have somehow forgotten its name. Stories, art, music, language, and literature bring us close to the truth of a place. They help us change a place, its culture, by creating community. I have a sense that more and more of younger people in Canada are impassioned about the land, have some sense that the land belongs to them and they belong to it. They have, in a way, found or are looking for a relation to land that is like that of the indigenous peoples of this country, so that everybody in this country could have that feeling for land that is spiritualized, that is based on an appreciation of its meanings, its stories and its strengths. Final thing that I want to add to this is what I said right in the beginning, I believe very strongly, our artists. We have to support the creation of art and new ideas and new visions. It seems to me there is some kind of a sea change going on.